last century, Henry Thoreau said that the majority of men lead lives of quiet desperation. It's much more true in the 20th century. At the beginning of this century, the proportion of atheists in the world was very tiny. Now it's probably the greater part of 50% of the world professes atheism. But Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, the trouble with secularism is it's so horribly pessimistic. It's not very encouraging to get up in the morning and look in the mirror and truthfully say, hi, you meaningless clot of coincidental molecules. It doesn't nerve you for the day to believe there's no meaning, no significance, no value in anything. Or if there's a zero at the end of life, everything along the way is a zero. The love of spouse for spouse, parents for children, lovers for their lover. It's all meaningless unless there's a heavenly father who will one day ransom us from death. So Solzhenitsyn was right. Secularism is so horribly pessimistic. The poets have seen it. One poet put it like this, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. The best lack all conviction and the worst are filled with passionate intensity. We live in a century where the government has killed more than a hundred million people. The governments of Earth. Solzhenitsyn believed that Stalin was responsible for more than 50 million deaths. There have been more martyrs for Christ in our century than in all the other centuries put together. Dostoevsky was right when he said, if there's no God, everything is permitted. I fear that man most who fears God least. Murder makes sense if there's no God. Whoever gets in the way, get rid of them. But there come the lonely hours and the approach of death and people have second thoughts. They want to know what to believe. One poet said, we need a theme, then let that be our theme, that we poor grovellers between faith and doubt, the sun and north star lost the compass out, the heart's weak engine almost stopped, time, timelessness, chaos of our wills, that we need a theme, something to think, something to say between dawn and dusk, something to hold to, something to believe. You see, the death of hope leads to the hope for death. One edition of Encyclopedia Britannica this century, by accident, left out hope. And thereby it mirrored the 20th century. Because if there is no God, and if there is no Christ, if the Bible is not true, there is no hope. There is no meaning. We are just meaningless clots. We are just animated mud. But if the Bible is true, and Christ is God, we have infinite significance. And we can anticipate a life that will measure with the life of God himself. How much would millions in the world give for a key to life and death? How much they would give for a solution to guilt, sorrow, and mortality? How much they would give for an answer to the mysteries of life and death? Well, we're going to look at that key this morning. If we lift this key, it'll lift us. If we take it to our bosom, it'll draw us to the bosom of God. I refer to the key of the cross, the greatest event of time and eternity was when we tucked God into the bed of the cross and nailed his hands and feet and opened his side. His arms spread an invitation to his crucifiers, giving away heaven to a penitent thief. 
that was the greatest hour of the universe. And without it, the universe would have broken out in anarchy, that God should have permitted sin and do nothing about it. But he did something about it. And we're going to consider what he did in the cross. To take the cross from the Christian would be like blotting the sun out of the sky. Kneeling at the foot of the cross, we've reached the highest place we can attain. It's the sweetest melody of human lips to talk about the cross. It's the one interest that should swallow up every other. To many people, the cross is just an ornament to wear around the neck. To architects, it's a symbol to hang on a church. To atheists, it's a superstition. To scholars, it's a subject for research. To preachers, it's a text for a sermon. To Constantine, it was a sign of victory. To the pagan Romans as a whole, it was just uh, an object of execration, a means of execution, horrid and terrible and feared. To Paul, it was a sign of glory that pointed to heaven. To Mary, it was a memory of agony. To two thieves, it was different. To one thief, it was the door to perdition. The other thief, it was the gateway to paradise. To Christ, the cross was a coffin and a throne. To multiplied millions, the cross is an anchor. It offers a refuge and a haven to storm-tossed souls. The cross was the Sermon on the Mount enacted. It was the Ten Commandments demonstrated. It was 1 Corinthians 13 exemplified. The cross was the fruit of the Spirit in full harvest. It justified God. It ransomed the world. It consolidated heaven. It shook hell. It condemned the devil. It brought in everlasting righteousness. It satisfied justice. It magnified the law. It delighted God the Father. It glorified God the Son. And it brought down God the Holy Spirit. It confirmed the everlasting covenant. It opened heaven for all who would believe. That's the cross of Christ. And we're going to consider it. We're going to look at the last 24 hours of our Lord's life as he dealt with sin. You know, if sin's a trifle, righteousness will only be a trifle. We need to recognize in sin that thing that's broken hearts and blighted homes, robbed heaven, and made hell the high capital of the universe. We need to recognize in sin the most devastating fact in the universe. Sin's a madness in the brain it's a poison in the heart. Sin is like a guillotine cutting off the head. It's like a lightning streak heading for earth. It's like a lion looking for its prey. Sin's a tornado on the loose. It's a volcano gone wild. Sin is the most terrible of all terrors. Because of sin, every stream of human life is polluted. Every breeze is corrupt. Every pathway of life is dangerous with pitfalls. Every voyage of life has perilous shoals. Sin destroys happiness. It darkens the intellect. It sears the conscience. It promises velvet and it gives a shroud. It offers liberty and it brings bondage. It promises nectar and it gives gall. It proffers silk and it gives sackcloth. Sin is the most awful deception. It's a funny thing about sin. When you're tempted, the reward looks so wonderful. Sin never comes with a bare hook. It's got to look good. And what it promises always looks huge and wonderful. Whereas the sin itself is so slight. That's before, but after it's the opposite. 
If we yield to temptation, then the reward suddenly crumbles away. The manna turns to worms. The nectar turns to gall. Now the act of sin is huge. The reward is slight because sin is a cheat. Sin is a cheat. I want you to consider how much space the Bible has given to this central theme of the cross. Only 42 days our Lord's life are alluded to in the New Testament. Only 42 days. That's approximately one day in every 350. And yet, approximately 30 verses out of 89 in the Gospels revolve around Passion Week. And about half of those are about the last 24 hours. If the whole Bible was dedicated to just the life of Christ, giving each day as much space as it now gives to his last day, we would have a Bible of approximately 200,000 pages. So that gives some idea of the importance of the cross event. And the mark of true religion and true Christianity is always to give the same sense of proportion to the cross as God has done. That's why Paul could say, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord. I determined to know nothing among you, he said, but Christ and him crucified. We're going to look at the commencement of the end. We're going to look at the story first of Gethsemane. We're going to see how God intervened and what he did and how it works. I'm reading to you from Matthew, the 26th chapter, and beginning at verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go yonder and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Mark's Gospel says he was greatly distressed. The Greek expression gives the idea of someone who's seen a spectre. Greatly distressed. He said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he came to the disciples. He found them sleeping. He said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is one of the most mysterious pictures in all of history and biography. You know, when Socrates died, he was very calm. He said to one of his disciples, now remember I owe a, a chicken to somebody, pay my debt. Socrates was calm as on a summer's day taking a stroll. Why is Jesus so upset? Is he more cowardly than Socrates? The only answer is that the weight of the sin of the world is now resting upon Christ. He had sung a hymn just an hour or so before with the disciples. He had joyously led out in the great Hallel from the book of Psalms. But as he enters Gethsemane, a mysterious weight begins to fall upon him. I can imagine him stumbling in those last steps. And then he says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. And as Mark says, he's greatly distressed. And Luke says that he sweat drops of blood can you imagine the pressure that leads a person to sweat drops of blood? So the difference between Christ and Socrates is that Christ has now become as sin incarnate. And God is treating him as though he's dealing with the sinful world. He's there as our substitute. He endures what we deserve. That's the only thing that can explain the mysterious agony of Gethsemane and the cry of dereliction on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It only makes sense if he represents me there, if he's suffering what I should have suffered. Indeed, he's being treated as the devil. There's a fascinating story in Second Samuel, you remember it, 
that when that beautiful boy, Absalom, rebelled against the king, he ended up suspended between heaven and earth on a tree. It tells about it in 2 Samuel 18. Here's Absalom, without spot or blemish, but proud and rebels against the one who gave him life. He's a figure of Satan, Lucifer, who was once without spot or blemish, but who was very proud and who rebelled against the God who gave him life. And when you read in 2 Samuel chapter 18 about Absalom being caught and suspended on a tree between heaven and earth, that is a preview of when the son of David, another son of David, would come. Absalom, you remember, was David's son. Another son of Absalom, of David, would come and be suspended between heaven and earth in order to atone for the sins of the rebels of the world. He would take the place of Satan himself, for the cross was an inverted sword that pierced Satan and destroyed him. So the Old Testament picture of Absalom suspended between heaven and earth, Absalom the figure of Lucifer, because he was so beautiful and yet so proud and rebelled. It's interesting, it tells us in 2 Samuel that David and his men went over the brook Kedron into Gethsemane. I'm reading from 2 Samuel 15, verse 23. And all the country wept aloud as all the people passed by, and the king crossed the brook Kedron, and all the people passed on toward the wilderness. Now to see the significance of that passage in 2 Samuel 15, Please look at John and chapter 18. John and chapter 18, at the very beginning, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley. So where David went, when his rebel son rebelled, Jesus went. When David's own child rebelled against him, David and his disciples went out of Jerusalem, crossed the brook Kedron, went through Gethsemane, and went up the Mount of Olives. So the son of David is now retracing the steps of David because of the rebellion of the Jewish nation, his own children. The name Kedron's interesting. It means dark waters. And it's important to know that all the names in the Gospel record have meaning. Jerusalem means foundations of peace because that's where the Prince of Peace would come offering the olive branch of peace between God and man. Gethsemane means the oil press. Here Christ would be pressed down under the terrible weight of the sins of the world. He'd been born in Bethlehem, which means the place of bread. He was the bread of life. He was brought up in Nazareth, which means the place of the branch because one of his names in the Old Testament is the branch of the Lord. He did much of his ministry in Capernaum, which means the place of consolation. He had wonderful fellowship in Bethany with the sisters, Mary and Martha, and Bethany means the place of sweetness, the place of dates, palm dates. Calvary means the place of the skull, Golgotha, and Calvary, one the Hebrew, Aramaic, one the Greek, both mean the place of the skull. Because of sin, the world has become a cemetery, a place of skulls. Here we do a little business, we indulge a little pleasure, and then we lie down beside the dead. In many places, the dust on which we walk has been man. And so God himself comes down to the cemetery of earth to the place of the skull. And he will reverse the tide of death. John 19, 41 says that in the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. He begins his walk to death in a garden, Gethsemane. He finishes it in a garden, because a garden's a place of life and death. A garden's a place where seeds are sown and they decay and they die, and lo and behold, they spring up again symbol of resurrection. Christ began in the garden. 
It's a replay of Genesis. In Genesis, you meet the first Adam, and everything's delightful. Now in Gethsemane and Calvary, you meet the last Adam, and everything's terrible. There was a conflict in Eden, but it was by day. The conflict in Gethsemane is by night. In the Garden in Eden, the first Adam was overcome. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the last Adam overcomes. Gethsemane becomes the rehearsal for Calvary. It's the anticipation. Calvary is the accomplishment. Here we see the will to suffer. Calvary, we see the work. But you must see its connection with the first Adam. In Eden, the garden there, the first Adam sinned. Here, the Saviour suffers. In Eden, the first Adam fell before Satan. In Gethsemane, the soldiers fall before Christ. In Eden, the first Adam parleyed with the devil, Adam and Eve. But this last Adam talks to his father. In Eden, Adam hid. Where art thou? I was afraid. I hid myself. Sin makes us cowards. But in Gethsemane, the last Adam shows himself. In the Garden of Eden, the father comes looking for his rebel boy. God is looking for him. But in this Garden of Gethsemane, the last Adam's looking for God. My father, my father. From the first garden, Adam was driven. From the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ was led. They couldn't drive him. Remember, they all fell when he, stood, when he showed himself. Hundreds of soldiers fell to the ground. So he was led with dignity. The sword was unsheathed in Eden. It kept the way of the tree of life. In Gethsemane, Christ told Peter to sheathe his sword, put it back in its scabbard, because he was going to die on the cross so that the sword of wrath against evil would go back into the scabbard of heaven. So we're meant to compare the two gardens, the delightful, the terrible, the night, the day, the defeat, the victory, the place where Adam took the fruit and the place where the second Adam takes the cup, the cup of God's wrath, and drains it for us. Gethsemane begins the replay of the marks of the curse. There are seven marks of the curse in Eden. There's nakedness, there's thorns, there's sweat, there's sorrow, there's separation, there's the sword. All the marks of the curse that we find in Eden are replayed in Gethsemane and Calvary. So we read in the Gethsemane record, and he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. He's put naked on the cross like Adam was naked. The sword is unsheathed and opens his side. He becomes a man of sorrows. He's separated from God. My God, my God, why? He becomes a curse for us. All seven marks of the curse are fulfilled and exemplified in Gethsemane and Calvary. When you look at the story, you should be reminded of the transfiguration. There are many parallels between Gethsemane and the transfiguration. In both occasions, Christ is praying. In both occasions, he receives a message from heaven. Luke tells us an angel came to him in Gethsemane to strengthen him. On transfiguration, Moses and Elijah came to strengthen him as he talks about his death. So we have the Christ praying in each place, and he takes the same three disciples each time. And both occasions, they are puzzled. And when Christ comes and talks to them, it says in each case, Transfiguration, Angus, they wist not what to say. 
They didn't know how to answer him. But in the transfiguration, Christ was glorified. In Gethsemane, he becomes a man of horror and endures the terrors of the damned. So the transfiguration was the high point, the zenith, whereas this story is the nadir, the lowest point. And we're meant to compare them because you see the transfiguration followed Christ's announcement to the disciples, I'm about to go to be crucified. He'd asked them the question, who do men say that I am? And he'd gotten finally the answer, thou art the Christ. He said, yes, but now let me tell you about the cross. It's easy to remember what happened on the eve of the transfiguration and it cast light on Gethsemane. There in Matthew 16 and 17 you have the story of Caesarea Philippi, the great confession, thou art the Christ. Then we have the word about the church, on this rock I'll build my church. Then he talks about the cross, the Son of Man is going to be crucified. And then he talks about the coming. The, the crucifixion won't be the end. You know the story of the old southern preacher who described all the terrors of the cross. And he said, that's Friday, but Sundays are coming. It's always good to remember when it's dark, when it's gloomy, when you're hated and despised and depressed when you get bad news. That's Friday. Sundays are coming. And so Christ not only spoke about himself as the Christ, the church he would build, the crucifixion that was coming, but the return of Christ, the coming. All true Christian preaching will include those things. The Christ, the church, all who believe. Not denominationalism. The Christ, the church, the cross, and the coming. So when you compare the transfiguration with Gethsemane, each helps to unlock the other. There can only be the glory of the transfiguration, which one day will be ours, when this mortal puts on immortality, when this corruptible puts on incorruption. That can only be because of what Christ suffered in Gethsemane. No suffering, no atonement. It's important we remember that the cross is about the holiness of God. It is about the love of God in a wonderful way, but the love is part of his holiness. God's holiness is a circle, and in it are all his other attributes. There are some today who make popular the moral influence theory that says the cross wasn't really necessary. It was just a gesture to show that God loved you. Oh, my friends, that is not true. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. The cross shows that the law is sacred, Nothing can destroy it. If it could have been changed, Christ needn't die. The cross is the monument to the perpetuity of the moral law of God. But it also reveals that the God who in the beginning threatened the penalty of death to lawbreakers in order to safeguard the universe, that he loves the lawbreakers. The wonderful message of the cross is that despite what we are, God loves us still. No one can ever love God until convinced that God loves them. If the argument of a suffering and dying saviour doesn't move men and women, there's nothing on earth that can move them. The cross tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son and with him himself and with him his spirit and with the Trinity all the angels of heaven he gave them all that whosoever believeth might not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen.